Jesus reigns in my heart. That's first and foremost my praise I give to him. And this is Pentecost Sunday. It's the, the, the Sunday that we remember the time when God poured out his Holy Spirit on the 120 believers in the upper room and the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 and 2 describes that. And I, I remember when the Lord filled me with his Holy Spirit. 11 years ago this month, it was June, June 13, 2006, 11 years ago this month that I prayed an altar of prayer and surrendered my life to, to God. I said, Lord, I want you to cleanse me. I want you to cleanse my heart. And he did. I believe he did the work. And it's alive and well for me today. And that, um, that first, Christ in me, the hope of glory, that's, that's my testimony as well. The other thing that makes me excited is studying God's word and what God has, has done for us. And not just kind of the, um, when we hear about Pentecost today and Pastor Bill's sermon, but the whole history of the Bible. A lot of history in the Bible. The Bible's a big book and covers a lot of lot of history and one thing that I'll be excited about as well is I'll be able to get to go study some of the history of the Bible in the land that it was taking place in. And so this is my trip this summer, Israel 2017. This is a map of modern day Israel. This is kind of a little sliver piece of land on the Mediterranean Sea in the, in the Middle East. And so I'm going to get to study at the Jerusalem University College. The Jerusalem University College is a Christian school founded in 1957 as a school for Christians to study study the Bible in the land of the Bible. And so it's located in the old city of Jerusalem. There is Jerusalem on the map. Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, Nazareth, Nazareth where he grew up. You can go and still see these, these towns today and see, see some place, places where where Jesus walked and where the land of the Bible took place. So here today I just wanted to give a little presentation, just show you some of the things I've been learning. And as you see, I've got all kinds of different maps and stuff, maps of the, the Bible and, and so forth. Looks like one of my maps fell out here. I've been doing lots of coloring on maps. They give me this book that tells you where to mark on these maps and send you these maps and say, take a colored pencil and mark where King David, here's David in Jerusalem, and David attacked the Philistines here, and here's, here's where the, all the people move around and stuff like that. So you get to visualize where, where the events of the Bible take place, and I'm really excited about that. And, and you can do this too as well if you got a good, good study Bible. A lot of, a lot of good Bibles have, have some really nice color maps in the back. If you have, have a Bible with you, you can open up and see some of these, these places and, and maps, maps as well. So I, I encourage you to look at those look at those maps on the back back of your Bibles to get a get a picture of some of the things that happened in the Bible. So here's just Israel among among the nations as like I say. Israel is just a little tiny strip of land as I said. This is a map of kind of the modern world. Here's Egypt today, Cairo, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, modern day Turkey. And Israel is just a little little tiny stretch of land. This is the land that God promised to Abraham nearly 4,000 years ago. And I'll give kind of just a brief history from the time of Abraham up, up to today. So, how big is Israel? Here's kind of Israel's size compared to the United States. So this little blue outline here is Israel within the whole scope of the United States. And here's here's an outline of Israel, the state of New York. The whole, whole country of Israel can, can fit within New York. And it's smaller than smaller than the state of Kentucky as well. And it's, it's in this little strip of land where most of the events of the Bible took place. Most most of the history took place right there in that little little strip of land. So um, it's about, I was comparing it to Kentucky. I, I was trying to um, look up different um, where Israel would fit in Kentucky. It's about about eastern Kentucky area, maybe about east of Lexington, about the whole eastern Kentucky area, about about the size of size of Israel. So what's what's the history of Israel? Where where does it begin? It begins clear back in the book of Genesis. And so here's just a brief overview of the country of, of Israel. So the beginning of Israel, around 1800-2000 BC, different people <coughs> date Abraham to different times. And we read about this in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. I'll just turn there real quick, where God tells Abraham, get out from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. And that Abraham lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. We read about that in Genesis chapter 11 verse 32 where it says that Abraham his wife and his family they went out from Ur of the Chaldees to the land of Canaan and they came to Haran Haran up in um, northern what is today the part of Syria or north, northern Iraq and, and then it tells us in the Bible that the Lord told Abraham get out from your country and from your family from your 
father's house. Go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so Abraham departed, as the Lord has said, with his nephew Lot, and Abraham was 90, or 75 years old. Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and says they set out from Haran. They departed from the land of Haran to the land of Canaan. And here God said to the Lord, or said, the Lord said to Abraham, to your descendants I will give this land. So Abraham built an altar. So that's just a few verses of the Bible. It says Abraham went from Ur to Haran to Canaan. And if we don't look at a map, we don't, don't really appreciate this journey of faith as much. You know how many miles this is from Ur to Haran? They say this is about 600 miles from Ur to Chaldees up to Haran. This was no overnight journey. This would have taken probably months of, of that time. Just traveling by camel or traveling with by donkey from Ur to Haran, then Haran to the land of Canaan is about another 400 miles. So about a thousand mile journey. And just, just a few verses of the Bible. So as we study these maps, we gain, gain an appreciation for the events of the Bible. This, the steps of faith that Abraham took. And Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, went to Egypt for a short time, and back in the land of Canaan, and dwelt there by faith. And he and his son Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, we, we looked at these in our Genesis Bible study. Jacob had 12 sons, and Abraham died, and so did Isaac. And then Jacob and his 12 sons went down to Egypt. That's where we find the story of Joseph. And eventually the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And then God had to bring them out of Egypt. And so here we have Israel out of Egypt under Moses around 1445 B.C. That's the kind of traditional date of the Exodus. All these different lines, these are different routes, different Ideas of where the Exodus might have might have taken place. And the Israelites were living in the land of Goshen and crossed the Red Sea at some point. Um, I'm not exactly sure where. Different different Bible scholars have you know, different ideas possibly where where the Israelites may have crossed the Red Sea and they went to Mount Sinai. Then they all eventually got to Kadesh Barnea, where we read in the Bible that the children of Israel they rebelled against the Lord at Kadesh Barnea. Here here God had brought them out miraculously out of Egypt. Ten plagues of Egypt, parting the Red Sea, it brought them out miraculously, it brought them to Mount Sinai, and then they rebelled against the Lord. And they're about ready to enter the Promised Land, enter Canaan, but they said, no, there's giants in the land, we can't do it. They saw what God had done to the Egyptians, but didn't have faith that God could bring them in. So God condemned them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and then under Joshua was when the Lord brought them into the Promised Land. And so eventually Joshua led them up in the land of past Edom, past Moab, eventually we get Joshua and led them up to, here's Jericho, that famous battle of Jericho that Joshua fought there. You can read that in the book of Joshua. God again parted the Jordan River and the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had promised to them. <laughs> this little red blob here is all the land that Joshua conquered under. And in the book of Joshua, you can read then there was some land to yet to be conquered in the green here. They they would not yet to conquer this land until the time of time of David. So they, they dwelt in the land of the twelve tribes of Israel. Here's just kind of the, all these blobs of color are the different tribes of Israel where where they all live. Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim. And these are kind of general locations. There, there were still Canaanites and Philistine cities that they had not had not conquered yet. So this is just kind of a general area of where the tribes to live until, until the time of David. And so hundreds of years went by and there was all kinds of different judges and the nation of Israel they disobeyed God and God would allow them to be attacked by their enemies and there's this kind of cycle of obedience and disobedience of the judges. And then, then they asked for a king and King Saul was the first king. And he, he disobeyed God and was, was killed by the Philistines. And so God he said, I'm looking for a man after my own heart and found King David. And so King David he was the one who made Jerusalem the capital of Israel. So around around 1000 BC, David took the city of Jerusalem, which was which was under the rule by the Jebusites. The, under Joshua, they had not not yet conquered that city. David conquered the city of Jerusalem, made it his capital. Uh, Jerusalem is about about right in here. Then from there, David conquered much of the rest of the land. This purple here was was the time of kind of the beginning of David's reign, and then the green is kind of extent of David's, David's kingdom under King David and Solomon. The Philistines still held just a little bit of, <clears throat> bit of land and some other nations as well, but for the most part, King David and Solomon um, 
ruled the land that God had promised to Abraham many, many centuries ago. And so, but then I don't have all the history in between here. Eventually the kingdom split. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom after Solomon. And things just started to go downhill from there. And, um, the, the thing about this land, God promised it to Abraham, promised it to his descendants, fulfilled that through Joshua and through David. But this was a land to be lived in by obedience. They were to obey God. And there is to be a land that God said you will be a holy nation and a holy people. You are to be a kingdom of priests and all the other nations will see you living out your faith and obeying God and they'll, they'll glorify God. Well, for the most part, Israel failed to do that. We, yes, we do see some high points. King David obeyed God, King Hezekiah, but there are a lot of wicked kings of Israel as well. So God let them go into exile. And the kingdom of Assyria came and conquered the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. And then Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Because they disobeyed God. You can read that in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah just laments over the loss of Jerusalem. It's like, you guys have been disobeying God. And so God's going to bring in these other nations to conquer you. And so a thousand years after David, Israel went into exile. And then some of them came back. And then eventually, there's a we can study all these different empires and uh, history tells about the Assyrian empires, and then the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians, then the Persians conquered the Babylonians, then Alexander the Great conquered the Persians, and then the Roman grew up out of that. So that's about a thousand years of history. And then we get to the time of Jesus, around in, um, in 5 BC, probably when, when Jesus was born. This is Israel during the Roman control. Rome, all the Caesars, Caesar Augustus, and see Julius Caesar, they built the mighty Roman Empire. Rome was in control of them of the promised land. The Jews, Jews had come back and were living in the land as well when, when Jesus came along. And so Jesus being the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan through Abraham. Jesus being a descendant of, of Judah. Of, of Judah, Isaac, of Jacob, Isaac, and, and Abraham. So these are different states that the Roman Roman Empire set up. Judea, Samaria, Perea, and, and such as well. So this is a, a state of Israel during during the time of Jesus' life. So just kind of quickly, so why why should we study the geography of the Bible? Why study the map? So this is kind of a big why question. We've been just covering brief history here and could go into a lot more detail, but but why? Well for one thing, the Bible is real history taking place in real time with real events and real places. We can we can go to some of these places today and see the ruins. You can go see the ruins of Jericho. Archaeologists have dug up the city of Jericho, the, the walls that fell down. You, you can go see the, the old city of Jerusalem today. But, so it will be some of the places I'll be going, going to see. And so Satan throughout time has tried to get people to doubt the historicity of the Bible. If Satan can get people to doubt the events, to doubt the places, to doubt the history of the Bible, he can get us to doubt the message of the Bible, the message of salvation, that God was working through his people, working in this land to bring about his plan of salvation in Jesus. Here's kind of an illustration. Just as it would be hard to play a board game without the playing board, it is hard to visualize the events of the Bible without the playing board, that is the land, in which the events took place. If I said, hey, let's sit down, let's, let's play a game of Monopoly, and I, I brought my Monop Monopoly game, and I got all my Monopoly pieces and all the cards and such, and then, oh, I forgot the board. Oh well, I got the pieces. We can we can just kind of try and make up a board or something. That'd be super hard to hard to play Monopoly or, or checkers with without the board to see where the pieces are moving, where the events are moving, where the people are moving, and so forth. And so the Bible gives us the people, the places, gives us the events, the armies that come in, and, and, and so forth. And the maps help us to visualize and kind of give us a realness to it that sometimes we miss it, just, just reading the Bible. As I, as I said, as you read about Abraham, okay, Abraham went from Ur to Haran, went to Canaan, so what? When you look at it on the map, you really appreciate what the, what the Bible is talking about. And so therefore, we have a better understanding of the message of the Bible when we know the places mentioned in the Bible. Archaeology helps us to verify some of the places in the Bible, digging up some of the different ruins and finding some of these different people and events and, and such, and helps confirm and helps, helps build build our faith. And yes, this is a book that can be trusted. We can, we can trust the places of the Bible, but we can trust the message of the Bible that, you know, that God wants us to put put our whole faith and trust in Him. And so, just going back to, to our map here, Pastor Bill talked about this today, I believe, when 
this is Pentecost Sunday, so I just thought I'd share a, just a little brief geography lesson from the book of Acts. This is Pentecost Sunday when Jesus pulled them to wait in Jerusalem. And here's what he told them. We'll, we'll just put this on the map. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, let's just look at these on the map. Here's our map of the Israel in the time of Jesus. Here's Jerusalem. That's, that's where the disciples were when Jesus was crucified and then he resurrected and appeared to his disciples and said, wait, wait in Jerusalem, wait here, and I'll pour out my Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a city. And then he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria. Judea is kind of a, a state that the Romans had set up or the tribe of Judah used to be the Romans set up the state of Judea and then the state of Samaria. So that's kind of like your neighboring counties or your neighboring neighboring state. You'll be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. And then he ends, ends the verse, Jesus says, and to the ends of the earth. What does Jesus mean by the ends of the earth? He means just that. All, all over the world, you will be my witnesses all over the place. And we see that in the book of Acts that Paul would did go all around the Roman Empire with the same before him. So here's just a little geography lesson from, from the books of Acts. And we can we can do this for pretty much any any book of the Bible, any any most cities of the Bible. Not, not every city of the Bible has been located by archaeologists, but most of them we know are generally where they are. Jer Jericho and Bethlehem, I believe we go in going to visit some of these places. When I'm over there in Israel, we're going to go to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus did a lot of his ministry in Galilee. Capernaum, we'll see. Caesarea was a famous port city during the time of Jesus. We'll get to go see that. And then we'll go to the Dead Sea and Jordan River. Some of these other different different places as well. So just kind of wrapping up here. Um, as you see, I've got up here lots of different maps and studies as well. And as I said, even if you're not able to go to Israel, there's lots of great resources that teaches about have lots of different pictures. I, I like pictures. I like picture books. When I was a kid growing up, I liked my picture books. Look, like my, my children's Bible that have lots of pictures. Well, now that I'm an adult, I still like picture books. I tell my wife, like, I want to, this book doesn't have enough pictures in it. I want, I want a book that's got pictures. So there's a lot of great resources that have all kinds of different pictures of the land of the Bible and all these different different cities and, and such. And we've got we've got some of them out in our library. Today I was pulling out some, some books in our library. I'll put a plug in for some of our books here. Pastor Bill wrote books. So these, these are the ones that I, I just pulled out. So, uh, High Above the Holy Land, I was just looking at. These have lots of great aerial photos of, of different cities of the Bible, and I was just scanning through this. This would be fun to just set out a table and just look at some of these different cities of the Bible and, and such. And uh, there's one on geography of the Bible. Oh, this one. I was looking through this one. This is nice. Well, the whole Holy Land in color. So I like, as I said, I like my color pictures. And so there's there's our different different cities and, and such. And so we'll kind of take you through, walk you through the life of Jesus and showing you all the different places. So we can get a, kind of a visual in our head when, when these things, when the Bible talks about these people and places. Because here we are, we're living in America 2,000 years after Jesus. And many thousands of miles away from this land and the culture and we read about these um, customs and stuff, we read about biblical currency, like what, what's a denarius, what's a shekel, what, what, what's these different weights and measures, and so we can study in history the culture and the different different things that they did, the food that they ate. I have one book, oh yeah, day, Daily Life in the time, time of Jesus, so this just gives you a good overview of kind of the culture of the, of the time and different, different things they did. And, Gives you illustrations as well, so lots of great resources as well. So I encourage you to look at look at those maps in your Bible as you read the events of the, of the Bible to get get a better picture of what what the Bible is trying to say and to, to realize that yeah, yes, this is this is real history taking a place at a real point in time and that it calls us to obedience as well. Just as the nation of Israel, they lost their inheritance because of disobedience. God. God disinherited the nation of Israel for, for disobedience. And today, this is Abraham walked by faith in the land of, of that God promised him. We too, as Christians today, we, we walk by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, walk in the Spirit. And, and it gives lots of illustrations of that. Just as Abraham lived by faith, we 
live by faith in the promises of God as well. So I'm excited to go to Israel here. Lord willing, that we next this time next Sunday I'll be flying over there to Israel. So I ask for your prayers. Just pray for me as I travel. Airports kind of make me nervous. I don't want to miss my flight and things like that. So, so pray for safe travels as I travel over there. Pray, pray for safety along the way. Pray for my wife as well. She'll be here work, working and ministering as well while I'm over there. So appreciate your prayers as well. I'm sure when I come back, I'll have, have lots of pictures of my own to, to show you some more, more history lessons as well. So I guess I'll end with that, Pastor Bill. We are looking forward to that when you get back. I do love learning about this stuff. And uh, we're pretty privileged, I think. <clears throat> pretty privileged, I think, to have a, <clears throat> somebody on our church staff that is able to get this kind of education and share it with us. And it's going to benefit our church tremendously, as you all know. David teaches a Bible study on Wednesday night. I'm sure he'll be teaching more throughout the year. And this will help him with his classwork <clears throat> as well. And, uh, so this is not just supporting ministry of our church or David's education but supporting the ministry of the whole KMHA. So I'm excited to uh, be a part of that and uh, that this church should be a part of it. <clears throat> Would anyone like to volunteer or take an offer? Or we could just pass the plate around. We we'll just do that. So we'll start over here with David and pass the hand here. Make the way. So appreciate your blessings upon him. A couple of people might have to bridge a gap and just pass it over to Sarah with we'll pass it around there. A couple people might have to bridge a gap in there. Get up. Get the hand over yeah. I don't know if you're going to pray for me. Oh, yeah, we can do that. That would be a good thing to do. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just do thank you for this offering. Bless it, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we remain mindful of you, Lord, we thank you for your presence being here. So, Lord, we ask that this blessing be increased in a mighty way. And the Lord, that you would uh, <clears throat> just continuously just continues to bless this church with these kind of opportunities for it. We're thankful to be able to send somebody over to Israel and help take part in that effort. And we just want to pray that this, uh, that you would multiply this blessing, that you would use David over there to be a blessing to those who don't know the blessing of full salvation. We pray, Lord, he'd be a clear witness to that in the center of denominational school, that he, they would know the power of Pentecost, Lord Jesus, and testify clearly to it. Give him opportunities to we do thank you and praise you. So Jesus, I'm going to It's free. 
deal. Just so quick salvation reached me. Oh, bless God, I know it's real. But it's real, it's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled. For I know, I know it's real. And is it real for you this morning? Amen. Boy, that song bless me. It's great because it's kind of a narrative. Hmm. Well, it is Pentecost Sunday, isn't it? You all excited about that Pentecostal blessing? I am. There's one thing I'm unashamed of in my Christian life is I am not ashamed of the message of full salvation. I'm not ashamed whatsoever to say that Jesus doesn't leave us as orphans. He saves us from all sin, sets us free, now there's humanity we've got to work out. There's things that we've got to figure out as we go. As I was sitting there thinking about David's presentation this morning, how Joshua entered Canaan land, but it all wasn't conquered just yet. But boy, they were there. They were in the promised land. And uh, David came in there and conquered the rest of it. So it can be conquered. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know that we have the power to grow. I want to talk to you this morning about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask the Lord's help to do it. So Jesus, we do thank you and praise you again for this opportunity to come in here and proclaim that it is real that you save us, you sanctify us, you set us free from sin, and that, Lord, you help us, Lord Jesus. Now, I look out, Lord Jesus, this morning, and I don't see a lot of people here. Yeah, it does concern me because I'm wondering, Lord Jesus, why well, there's not a lot of people in our prayer meetings as well. I'm also wondering, Lord Jesus, where the fire is, the Pentecostal blessing. And I'm hoping, Lord Jesus, that we can answer these questions tonight. Get on fire for the things of God. And Lord, allow you to work through our lives in such a way that we will change the culture, that we will, we will be used in mighty and powerful ways to love our neighbor as our self. And Lord, we will reach out to them and Lord, share that blessing with them and bring them into the fold. Oh, God, would you please help us. We have a message of full salvation on our lips and in our hearts. Help us to proclaim it to all who are here. Because in Jackson, Kentucky, in this city, Lord, there's nobody else preaching it. There's nobody else proclaiming it. And, Lord, we want to change that in the name of Jesus. We want to be a holiness witness in this area. And, Lord, we want to look back to our lineage and say praise God for the foundations that have been formed and we want to build a mighty tower of holiness ministry in this area, Lord Jesus, with a clear vision of what this Pentecostal blessing really is and how it can affect our lives, meet all of our base needs, Lord, and take us well beyond that, Lord, into the promised land of Canaan. Help us to open up our hearts, Lord Jesus. We have to believe it to receive it. We can't doubt it. We can't struggle against it. We can't fight against it. And I pray that this morning you have set hearts free through the power of of the Holy Spirit and in your boldness, Lord God. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We bless your holy name. Lord, help us not to strive against you this morning, but to open our hearts. We ask that you destroy every work of the devil. Cast him out of here, Lord, and open up our hearts and ears to the fullness of your power. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to open with this statement. We cannot hope to have a vibrant Christian life or ministry without the presence of the Holy Spirit deeply involved with our life. What we believe about the Holy Spirit will be exactly how much victory we have in our life. And without victory, we cannot have ministry. We can't tell anybody or preach to anybody or witness to anybody or bring anybody up to a spiritual experience that we do not have. Joel 2 and 28 <clears throat> said that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men, young men shall see visions. As a prophecy of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Then we look at the greatest man ever, ever born of a woman. <clears throat> John the Baptist. And everyone has heard of John 3.16 that speaks of the wonderful 
uh, the truth of salvation. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Most of you guys can finish that, right? Whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Praise God. But what about Luke 3.16? John 3.16 tells us about the blessing of salvation, initial salvation. Luke 3.16 tells us the blessing of full salvation. As John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's two baptisms in every Christian life. One baptism, me or David, can take you and, and baptize you, and it's a testimony. You being saved and born again. But I can't give you this second baptism. It only comes from Jesus Christ. I can't do it. It's Jesus' baptism. And the Bible is very clear that if we reject this baptism, we are not rejecting God, we're rejecting man, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says. Jesus presented the Holy Spirit <clears throat> as an all-encompassing satisfier of man's deepest needs. In John chapter 7, uh, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. He stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the Scripture has said. I think that's very crucial in this day and time. We believe in Jesus as the Scripture has said. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, praise God. But he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in Him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now you see this is a progressive story. What I've done is basically get, David gave you a brief history of Israel. I gave you a brief history of the prophetic utterances of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit would be poured out on Pentecost. And if it wasn't for that Pentecostal outpouring, if it wasn't for the Disciples deciding to tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had come upon them. We wouldn't be sitting here today. It was the birth of the New Testament church. And it's okay. I understand some people don't like to hear about this. It costs too much. Only the hungry after God get it. Only the hungry after God receive it. It's rejected by the majority of the church what I'm about to teach you today. And I really don't care. That's just my opinion. Really don't care. So were the apostles, and so were Jesus, so was Noah. And praise God that I could be counted worthy to be rejected as well. <clears throat> but, looking back, that's what these other men that said the Holy Spirit would do. For some reason, people tend to forget that you know the whole Word of God is inspired by God. And they think it's more authoritative to see what the red letters say. So I thought we would do that today and just see just exactly what Jesus clearly said about the Holy, Holy Spirit. And I, we're going to call this just for the sake of it be a little bit easier. If you ask somebody ask what the preacher preached about this morning, you can just say, well, he preached about the he wills. <laughs> he preached about the he wills. That's a new word, isn't it? It's because it's two words put together. It sounds funny, I think. But we're going to look at six statements that Jesus said in John chapter 16 um, about what He will do. The Holy Spirit is a He. He's not an It. What It is, referring to the Holy Spirit, is the promise of the Father. But He is essentially a person. So we're going to look at John chapter 16 and picking up at verse 6. And this you will see these, these few things that are the most important to know about the Holy Spirit. Beginning at verse 6. Uh, I'm in Luke. I do that all the time. Huh? John chapter 16. Here we go. Picking up at verse 6. Okay. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. If I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of 
sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they did not do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the world, the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. <clears throat> However, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you the things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father are mine, therefore I said that He will take of mine and declare it to you. So first, you look at John chapter 16 and verse 8. He will convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So we'll give a brief history of this the reason we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. We call it Pentecost Sunday because they were there in Jerusalem for the Pentecost festival. And in the festival of Pentecost, they were there all celebrating in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there it was a gigantic festival. And you all have seen the honey festival. It is a very small festival. But I have noticed working in the ministerial booth, there are people that make a pilgrimage back to Breathitt County every year to go and check out the honey festival. They make a pilgrimage down there. They really do. Can you believe that? They drive for miles around. I've talked to people from Michigan and Ohio and Indiana that have driven all the way down here just to meet at the honey festival. They make their pilgrimage. And that was what was going on in the Pentecost festival. There was a pilgrimage that happening and there were, as, as David was showing you in the way we saw those maps this morning, there were different countries from all around. So all these different Jews, I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus picked the day of Pentecost because these people would hear the message and go back into their respective countries and testify as to what they had seen. <clears throat> so if you pick up in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with all accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, rushing and mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared in the I'm sorry, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Whenever the King James Bible translated from the Latin Vulgate was uh, translated, <clears throat> tongues was a very important word back in those days, which meant very basically different languages, different languages from all over the world. We speak here in a hillbilly kind of tongue, I guess, and then people from Indiana, they would say they have more of a northern tongue, but to be more specific, Brother Gary's right now in China dealing with some Chinese tongues, and I guess over in um, Papua New Guinea, Dave Street and his mission team are dealing with some pigeon tongues. That's the kind of tongues that this is talking about. When the Holy Spirit came down upon them, they became powerful witnesses to the truth in no unknown language, but a known language. As you see the miracle of languages in Acts chapter 2, in verse 8, it goes on to say, those people looking on to these, these Pentecostal uh, blessed believers, they were saying, and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? They were getting specific about this. They were saying in each and their own language in which we were born. How are these people from Galilee speaking in Egyptian? How are these people from Galilee speaking? This has to be a real miracle. And of course the unlearned people were standing around looking out and saying, well they must be drunk. But those who were from these foreign language places, these places where these foreign languages originated, they were saying, oh my goodness, here's the truth. And in our language. And then Acts 2.37 said when they were hearing the truth and in their language, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Their conscience was awakened. That was the greatest miracle of Pentecost. The greatest miracle of Pentecost wasn't any sort of spiritual gift. I think the greatest miracle of Pentecost was the 3,000 souls. They were brought into the church on that day. <clears throat> and I just love this, even today, I can imagine Peter standing up there, 
for the first time and preaching with real conviction coming on coming on people's faces. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to see the conscience of man being brought together to the truth for the first time and they being convicted of that sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. And if we have a ministry that has the Holy Spirit in it, that is what the Holy Spirit will do through us as individuals. We will be used. Our own tongue can be used to convict others of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And that's the real power of Pentecost, which is boldness spoken forth the truth from our own tongue into others. And I'm just so thankful today that this is still taking place in mission fields all over the world where people will stand up and begin to speak in a language that they don't recognize, but the people that are standing before them are seeing it are recognizing it. Like the Christian missionaries in 1958 whose lives were spared because they spoke in a language that had never been charted, never been written, never been understood. But they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, were able to speak in their language. And it brought fear, struck fear into that tribal land and they were able to plant churches. It's still going on. When you convict somebody of sin, righteousness, and judgment, it will awaken their consciousness for the first time to the fear of the Lord. And we need that today so desperately in our churches. As I see young people, it seems like left and right on social media and in the streets talking about how, oh, how they love Jesus and how He loves them and they overlook He overlooks my sinfulness and He overlooks this and overlooks that. And they've kind of got a false image of who God is because they do not fear Him. Well, that's the first ministry to every believer and the first ministry through us to a non-believer is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In 16 of John, turning back to John, chapter 16, in verse 13, Jesus goes on to say, However, when the Spirit of truth has come, can we just camp on that a minute? You know the Holy Spirit is not going to guide you anything into anything that's untrue. He's just not going to do it. He will guide you into truth. He will guide you in to all truth. Truth will quicken our conscience and make way for us to follow the Lord more closely. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18-20, through 20, Paul said to Timothy, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. A good conscience. Faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith, having suffered, suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may not learn the blasphemy. Whenever we come into the presence of the Holy Spirit, He will guide us into all truth. And it's only our conscience. Our very own conscience will reject that. That's the only thing that will stand in the way. If we are, if we are resisting against our conscience, we will not ever expect to live a life that is filled full of freedom. You will always have a life filled full of bondage. Filled full of absolute shipwrecked bondage delivered over to the devil just as soon as you start striving against the Holy Spirit. You will not be able to put up with a Spirit-filled church. You will not be able to put up with Spirit-filled fellowship. You must be guided into all truth. That's the only thing the Holy Spirit can do. And whenever your freedom is being robbed, you're avoiding your conscience. There's nobody who will go to hell on accident. God will be faithful to show you the way. The Holy Spirit is truth. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 17, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and He will be in you. <clears throat> when we're living for the world, we cannot receive the Spirit of truth. Whenever the <clears throat> disciples went to the upper room of Pentecost, the day in which we're celebrating right now, they rejected the world. They tarried and rejected the world and tarried until the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit will guide and teach our conscience. He will quicken our conscience. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all things that I said to you. 
And it's sad to say that when we reject truth, and I see people do this all the time, they go up and they go down, they go up and they go down, they go up and they go down. They just need to grow up and mature and get settled. It says when we reject truth, our conscience becomes seared. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul continues to tell Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says in a later time, some people will depart from the, the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When we reject truth, we reject the way of the Holy Spirit, our conscience gets seared. Our sin becomes less and less controllable. Our relationship with God seems farther and farther away. The conscience can be seared. <clears throat> it's amazing when you start thinking of just the little things that go on in this, in this earth, <clears throat> on this world, when you observe little nuances within our culture, how, how people affirm the Bible. I wouldn't even say that they're Christians, but they would say something like this, I cannot do that in good conscience. <clears throat> not knowing, not even, aware, not even aware that the whole Bible speaks about the conscience being our God by the Holy Spirit. The conscience changes whenever we're born again. Born again. We become conscious of sinful things. We, become, we have a consciousness of, of our need to be in church. We have a consciousness of our need to pray. We have a consciousness of the Word of God that we've never had before because the Spirit opens up to us. But we also have a consciousness of sin right still with us. And I've been reading through uh, <clears throat> Leela G. McConnell's first book, The Pauline Ministry in the Kentucky Mountains. It's amazing how, how she reached our eastern Kentucky people here. It's wonderful Kentucky history, if nothing else. It just talks about how people used to live and how people used to go and <clears throat> And do these things. And it's amazing to me how much they they understood the depths of salvation <clears throat> to be such a backwoods culture that had never been reached, but they understood that the consciousness of sin was not salvation. Departure from sin was salvation. And there was <laughs> over and over and over again, there's little testimonies in there of young people that were getting saved and they said, I knew that I had a consciousness of sin and then I got saved. I got born again wonderfully in Martha Archer's camp meeting, the revival meeting that she had in, up here in the hall. But then I knew as I kept on following Jesus that evil was still present right there with me. It was so amazing to hear people from Eastern Kentucky talking like that. You don't hear that from young people anymore. Evil was right there with me. They were saying over and over again, and I wanted to do good. Evil was right there with me. Our conscience deepens. When we receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, whenever we receive that blessing of Pentecost, we are able to live in a deeper and more holy life. If you go on to read those testimonies, they say, and then I got the blessing. They always called it the Canaan land experience. I entered into the Canaan land experience, and evil was no longer with me when I willed to do good. Such a wonderful thing. We should be reading some books, guys. We should be reading some books. They will bless you with the means of grace, I believe. What does it say also in 6, 16 13? Isn't it amazing how Jesus can give us so much truth in just one little verse? He says, uh, However, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. And then He said, For He will not speak of His own authority. I like how the King James words that. He said, He will not speak of His own initiative. He will not speak of His own initiative. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Verses 10 through 13, Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit speaks with a heavenly authority through us, but God has revealed to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul was recognizing that he had no authority apart from the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Whenever we read Scripture, we need to trust that the Holy Spirit will reveal Scripture to us. He will search out the deeper things of God, and then he will speak into others as well. What will be revealed is truth 
then, and this is something that we need to really wrap our head around in this day and age, what will be revealed as truth has already been revealed in God's Word. There is no more continued revelation, they call it. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, Solomon said, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. If it is truth, if God has revealed to you a deeper thing, it has to be tested with Scripture. We have to know it with Scripture. That is our authority. When we start voiding this authority, we go out in many different places and in many different directions. And that's what's going on today with a lot of these cults and a lot of these things that's going on. We have to stand upon the authority of the Word of God. It is finished. It is complete. It is done. There it is. There is nothing new under the sun. It's amazing to me and it really enriches my life when I read commentaries that have been written from all the way to 300 years ago up until now. They all say about the same thing. It's pretty amazing to me. These people are all saying just about the same thing. There is no new truth. The truth is absolute. It is eternal. It is there. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said, I am the truth and we know the truth is eternal. He also said it's the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is eternal. And so therefore there is no truth that has not already been revealed. It's already there. We have to just seek out that truth and live ye in it. So my question is, <clears throat> as Christians, what would we say is our only source of truth? This is your chance to talk. What is our only source of truth? not your preacher. What's that? The Word. the Word of God. God will not mention anything to anyone that cannot be confirmed through Scripture in 2.18. This whole kingdom mysteries movement that I'm starting to come upon TV, the mysteries and the Shekinah mysteries and all this mystery stuff. God's will is never a mystery. You all understand that? God's will is definite. It is sure. It is not something mystical that we sit around and, and as some, somebody they're using these strange words like soak it in the spirit and all this weird stuff. We don't need that stuff. We need the word of God. The more we understand the word of God, the more it quickens our prayers, deepens us in the Holy Spirit because you know who offered the word of God? The Holy Spirit. And you can seek all day on your knees for five hours trying to find a word from the Lord when you should just be turning, turning the pages here there's 36,000 plus sentences, I think, in the Bible. All of them words from the Lord. It's there. <laughs> we just need to find it. We need to get a hold of it. And we need to allow God to change us. <clears throat> Lead us in the truth. Speak with authority. Chapter 16, verse 13. And uh, the third part of verse 13, it says, But whatever he hears, he will speak. <laughs> I heard somebody say just a couple of years ago, <clears throat> God ever told me that, that, if somebody ever told me that God uh, spoke to them, I'd say they're full of it. And he used more church and force words than that. I said, well, God speaks to me every day. How's that problem? <laughs> he still speaks. It'll always be lined up with the Word of God. It'll always be sweet, gentle, and encouraging. We'll always have a check. You know, the devil speaks too. We have to discern those things. He can come appearing as an angel of light. He can even sing like the right one sometimes. But if we discern it through the Word of God, we will always be led, led, uh, led into all truth. Yes, God still speaks to us today. Did you know that? Did you know that you can hardly call yourself saved if God isn't speaking to you on a daily basis? I would be very, very concerned if you didn't have what, what is called in Romans the witness of the Spirit in Romans 8, 16 and 17 it says the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Is the Spirit speaking to you? Is the Spirit showing your needs, bucking against it? I mean, that's what happens. You can quieten the voice of the Holy Spirit by rejecting truth. He goes on to say all these promises. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if we indeed suffer with Him, that we might, may also be glorified together. The witness of the Holy Spirit. 
Him speaking to us on a daily basis. That is an assurance of heaven. If that's not going on in your life, if you can't come to prayer and it be a two-way conversation, then you need to have it cleaned up. Something needs to happen. Something needs to go on. Because maybe you're disobeying God. You can quench the Holy Spirit, guys. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, people don't like their salvation challenge. People don't like their spiritual experience challenge. They just don't like that. But it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and it's our duty to do this with one another, to examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed, unless indeed you are disqualified? Have you ever thought about testing your salvation? Have you ever thought about doing that? There's so many people that don't like to do that. You know why? Because they're not saved and they don't want to come to real revelation. I thought about just preaching a whole sermon on testing your salvation through Scripture. I preached one a couple of years ago. It might be high time to do it again. <clears throat> Test your salvation. Test to see that you're in the faith. You know, I, I was noticing too as I was reading through this appalling ministry book, it's so filled full of spiritual and spiritual truth. It was amazing how when people would get saved, one of the things they'd cry out is, I've got the witness. I got the witness. I got the witness. They would come to the altar and pray and they'd cry for hours until they got the witness of the Holy Spirit. See, we often we often we have done down salvation today until we believe in a couple of things and then we're saved and we walk off the altar still feel full of sin. And I've noticed a different one of the major differences between the church a hundred years ago and the church today is those people did not leave the altar until they were assured of their salvation. Now people don't like to hear about that anymore. People just don't like to hear about that kind of stuff. They don't like to hear about a Christianity that requires a little bit of determination, a little bit of discipline, a little bit of truth. People today feel like, well, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm saved. But do you have the witness of the Holy Spirit? Is your heart regenerating? Are you justified? Are you sanctified? All of those things, those are all like a big bicycle wheel. They're all spokes in the same wheel. Salvation is this all-encompassing thing in our life. We've done it down to ascending to a couple of truths of praying and praying. Do you have the witness? Does God's voice speak to you? Do you know His voice? And has it set you free? Moving on to chapter 16 and verse 14. <clears throat> and this is so crucial today. He will glorify me. He will glorify me. Now I don't get behind these people like IHOP and this crazy stuff that's going on. I ain't talking about the International House of Pancakes either. Talking about the International House of Prayer. I don't get behind those people one bit. I wish that I wish to God every one of them would be shut down. You've got people running around barking like dogs, howling like monkeys, and all this crazy stuff. I mean, who, where in the world does this stuff glorify Jesus? That's what we must understand is the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. He will always point us to Jesus. If, your Holy, if the Holy Spirit is clear in a ministry that Holy, the Holy Spirit is pointing people to Jesus, not an experience of the Holy Spirit, but a deeper life with Jesus, He will always glorify Jesus. And I hear people, I heard people not, not a few years ago, I, I had these conversations with people, it just blows my mind in the scriptural ignorance. They said that some certain spiritual gift edifies their inner man. Edifies the inner man. You've got to be kidding me. Edifies the inner man. We don't. The inner man needs to be put to death, first of all. Second of all, any spiritual gift will point others to Jesus. They're gifts of ministry. That's what they're made to do. Everything will always glorify Jesus if it comes from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it says in John 15, 26, our Savior said, But when the Helper comes, who I shall send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. He will testify of me. The Holy Spirit will always point us to Jesus. He will always testify of Jesus. 
No one can get the Holy Spirit without earnestly living a life that glorifies Jesus. And when you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you will live a life that glorifies Jesus. That's what it's all about. Jesus wants us to be a, an Ebenezer, if you will, a marker saying, say, look at this. Look back at where this person was and look where they are now. That brings more glory than anything. I like how Acts chapter 5, verse 32, most people would say this is the last requirement, but this is the first requirement of receiving the Holy Spirit in His fullness. Acts chapter 5, verse 32, we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given. Praise the Lord. But would you still praise the Lord if that, I told you that verse ended with given to those who obey Him? The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Jesus. Notice that there is a, there is a, uh, if you will, kind of a, a path that has to be taken care of there. You don't get the Holy Spirit to obey Jesus. You obey Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit. We call that consecration. That's as clear scriptural truth. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. We have to be sure that people will say, Oh, Bill, you're putting God in a box. No, my mind is completely open to everything this Bible says. I've told people before, uh, my mind is just as open as my Bible. And my Bible tells me that God only gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. But you must have a vessel prepared. Just as the Levitical priesthood prepared the Holy of Holies, we must also, by obeying Jesus, meet that requirement. That's as just as a requirement to receive the Holy Spirit as repentance is to justification. God accepts these stipulations. We must meet them. And apart from that, you can run the risk of getting things all out of whack with the Bible. You may, not, you may say, well, that's just not necessarily my experience. Well, it also says in the Bible that you can receive a different spirit. And it would probably be up to us to discern through Scripture what we have received, not by our feelings or emotions or any other thing, but just by what Scripture says. On the day that you receive the Holy Spirit, can you say that your life is being lived in obedience? Because if not, you've ran the risk of doing what Paul has said, receiving a different spirit that will always lead you astray, up and down, all over the place. When I put you on that highway of holiness, it settles you and gives you straightforward boldness, courage, and ministry focus to save the world for Jesus Christ. That's the whole thing, guys. That is the Great Commission. That is what the Holy Spirit is there for. It is a ministerial principle in our lives. That's what He wants to do. Give us power for ministry. <clears throat> Many Christians are less than they should be in that they do not glorify Jesus. Even many ministries are being formed that are trying to glorify Jesus today in the flesh. Your life must glorify Jesus in order to say that you're a part of His family. In, six, in chapter uh, 16 and verse 15, it says, In all these things the Father or in yeah, verse 14, I'm sorry, He will glorify me and then He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Matthew 11, 27, Jesus said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and those who the Son wills to reveal Him. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's His primary ministry is to reveal Jesus in a deeper way. He will take what is Jesus. He will declare it to you. And it will not line up with the sinful things of this world. It will not line up with the false sense of self that this world gives, it will be of Jesus. It will be otherworldly. It will be an eternal truth the Holy Spirit reveals to us. And I love how Stephen, the first martyr of the early church, said this, but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. <clears throat> what is it 
that got these got him killed. It was truth that got him killed. It was the truth of Jesus Christ that got him killed. <clears throat> it's an amazing thing when you preach under the authority and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because you have the ability. You have the power. I've got to a place now in my life where I just praise God that I have the ability to make a man. <clears throat> if what we said weren't true, it wouldn't be making anybody mad. It wouldn't even make it serious. It's truth that makes people, make sinners mad. But it is also truth that sets the saved free if we will. We can't expect anything less. Stephen got killed because of exalting Christ. The Holy Spirit, I hope, would lead us into such an honorable death as well to know that the last few words we said all exalted Jesus. Because that's what He did. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, your glass is always empty. You're always critical. Always bitter. Always waiting for somebody to fail. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, these things around us, here's Stephen on trial for his life. <laughs> and all he can think about is I see Jesus lifted up right there. And man, if the church lived like that today and kept their eyes on Jesus instead of everybody else, oh my goodness, we'd see revival, wouldn't we? Oh man. The church is so weak today. It's so unbelievably weak because we're focused on everything else but Jesus. There's so many false teachings about the Holy Spirit. Most people either turned off by it or teach it the wrong way. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. I'm not ashamed of it at all. <clears throat> people are always waiting around on an experience instead of just walking in the truth and the life that they have. <clears throat> It's become about growing a big old church instead of exalting Jesus and keeping our eyes firmly put on Him. Now, I'll just tell you, folks. 120 people can change the world. I think about 10 people can change Jackson if we really get serious about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I really do. We weren't so busy caught up in our own selfish ways, our own selfish thoughts, our own self-preserving um, me, me, me attitudes all the time. I'm worried about where the next problem is going to come from and wondering, wondering how we're ever going to make it. Oh my goodness. We just get our eyes upon Jesus and how the Holy Spirit can reign in our life. Boy, it really does simplify things. It really does simplify things. You know, it's Pentecost Sunday. We got to have our own Pentecostal experience. We really do. We got to have our own. It's a practical thing. It's not something that's just some high, exalted, super saint kind of thing, well I guess it is in a way that it isn't. We have to have our own Pentecostal experience. <clears throat> and it will be tested, not by what happens directly after it, but how you live ten years after it. It will change the way that you live. I've said many times behind this pulpit, I don't know where I'd be without my own personal Pentecostal experience that one night up in my bedroom after I laid down a winter dragon hill book and showed me a type of Christianity that I didn't even know existed. I've never been taught. I've always supposed that that kind of Christianity was out there, but I've never heard of it. Never knew clearly how to get it. And I did. Realized I had to die out completely to myself. I had to die out to all my, <clears throat> my little human ways and all my little selfish desires and all my little plans for life. I had to die out to it all. <clears throat> You can reject it all you want to. You can walk away from it all you want to. You can get tired of hearing it all you want to. And I'll tell you what, the reason people get tired of hearing it is because they know it's true and they don't accept it. We have to have our own Pentecostal experience, folks. We can try to reason it out of our life. We can try to say it's not real. It's too easy to criticize the saints that testify to it. Forget that they're human beings and see through it glass darkly. It's too easy <clears throat> to see that people still have to grow in light, but it's too easy to be critical if you die out for yourself. <clears throat> it is. I'm getting too honest this morning. And I'll tell you what, you're never going to be the Christian that you want to be. You're never, ever going to be the Christian. You're always, you're, you're always going to be thirsting for these rivers of living water. You're never going to be there. You're always going to be desiring to go deeper with Jesus. That's never going to happen for you. 
You're always going to be wandering. You're never going to have a purpose. Never going to have a calling. You're never going to have authority on your life until you get this Pentecostal blessing. If you don't believe me, look at the history of the church. Start at the, start at the Gospel of Luke and read through the Gospel of Acts. <clears throat> You'll see two different kinds of disciples. Ones that had no direction and were petty and were cowards like most of the church today. And then you have the ones that were disciplined, had authority. God help us have the power of God to go out and save the lost and increase the church and exalt Jesus. Well, that's the kind of standard of Christianity I want this church to live in. I really do. And it is my sheer determination if I don't do anything else <clears throat> to get this church praying and on fire for Jesus Christ again. I don't know where we went. I don't know what's really happened. And I'm determined to spend the rest of this summer on my knees if I have to to get the fire back into this church. I don't know what's happened. I really don't. <clears throat> but as I testified this last week at our conference, I had a bunch of elaborate words written on that paper that would have told a lie about this church. It would have really told a lie about this church. I said that we had a tremendous year. We didn't have a tremendous year. We had a good year. But near as good as the first year, if we're not going forward, we're going backward. I need to figure out what we're doing. I need to pray and ask the Lord what needs to be changed. And if it's something I'm doing, it needs to be changed as well. I've already made a commitment to the Lord just to be transparent, to be more disciplined with my time, to be more disciplined with the administrative things in this church, and to pray through again. <clears throat> to not spend any time doing anything else but to pray through about things church. We want a new van. I'm going to pray through about a new van. <clears throat> we want to buy this building one day and put a holiness ministry in this downtown area. If that's God's will, I'm going to pray through for God's will on that. We're going to pray money. Guys, we can't do ministry. We can't do church without the Holy Spirit. Who cares not? Nice. We cannot. Then we have to walk in truth. We have to walk in the heavenly authority. We have to let God reign in our lives. We have to see what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit and walk in that truth. We have to see what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and walk in that power. Because there's a whole fleet of people out there that's going to fill a whole chamber of hell if we don't get on fire for this. I mean, really. We've got the potential in this church to really do something. And every church does. But while that's under my care, I am bound and determined. I am bound and determined to see that we change this world with Jesus. I mean, really do it. My prayer for this church, my first prayer that the Lord has given me, that we would raise up two missionaries out of this church in the next two years. I'm not talking about KMBC students. I'm talking about people from Jackson, Kentucky. People that regularly attend. Two people that are willing to go on a mission trip to the ends of this earth. I think that's a small prayer. I don't, I don't have much faith in believe. But are we willing to do that? <clears throat> would we be willing if God calls us? Well, I hope. I hope that's the case. That's true. So may the Lord increase our numbers, not for the sake of having a big old church, but for the sake of changing lives in this area. And may we be men and women of prayer and men and women who, when we stand before the judgment seat, Jesus can proclaim to us, not only well done, my good and faithful servant, but as a condemnation to every other person that ever tried to step in our way, these people walk with God. These people walk with God. Because when you walk with God, the things of this world will go strangely. When you walk with God, <clears throat> you can just stand in the face of the trial and tribulation with a smile on your face. Even this morning as I was being accused of gross sin before I even came into this church this morning. That's how the devil started my day. And I told them, it drove them crazy that I wouldn't give in to them. And I just told them I'd pray for them and I'd love them. They hated that response. They didn't expect me to respond and ruin my day. Instead, I got to lift up a drug dealer in prayer. When we walk in the truth, when we really walk in the Holy Spirit, has God taken that defensive part out of your heart and said, you know what? I'm here to live for Jesus. He never promised this world to be easy. And I'm going to be a revolutionary for Jesus Christ. The Lord will get it in me. 297. <clears throat> We're going to sing this one time through as a prayer. If anybody would like to respond, you can. Just say, you know what, Lord, begin with me. 
not where I need to be, you can start seeking that blessing tonight, this morning. Just let Him live in your life. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Lord, that is our prayer. The Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Lord, help us just get in the very near presence of the perfect will of God. You got it for all of our life, Lord. You bought it with a price. Lord, you didn't send the Holy Spirit without you being glorified. You weren't glorified until you died on the cross, Lord Jesus, for our sins. Help us to live our life in that way, in such a sacrificial way, Lord Jesus, that our obedience to Christ obeys you. We know that obedience is greater than sacrifice. The Lord, obedience often leads to sacrifice. So would you just help us to live sacrificial lives, Lord, that are willing to go that extra mile. we are willing to do just a little bit extra for God. Well, no, I don't even want to pray that prayer. Help us to do what you have called us to do and settle ourselves in the will of God. The early church never did just a little bit extra. Lord, it's about living in the perfect will of God. Help us, Lord Jesus, be surrendered to your Holy Spirit. God us in the truth. Give us authority. Reveal the deeper things, Lord Jesus. Convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment if need be. Lord, I want to pray and ask that we would walk every day in the light of the judgment. And that, Lord, we would allow your Holy Spirit to prepare us for that great day. So, Lord, we now give this time to you, and I pray that there's even people in this room right now that are willing to give their lives to you perfectly. So, Lord, use us, we pray. This Pentecostal Sunday help us remember the history in which we came from and wonder why are we living in it now? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.